and ABC iView. Today, the opposition launches a $5 billion housing promise to tackle infrastructure delays. A woman's died and a police search is underway for two children last seen in the water in Sydney's southwest. A glitch blamed as Commonwealth Bank customers are charged twice for purchases. And voting underway in the nation's capital to decide who will lead the ACT for the next four years. Hello and welcome to ABC News, I'm Ruby Cornish. Opposition leader Peter Dutton has unveiled a major new coalition housing policy in Perth today, a $5 billion fund to fast-track the development of new roads and water infrastructure to new housing developments. Political reporter Oliver Gordon has more from Parliament House in Canberra. It really has been a week that's been dominated by housing, hasn't it? It started off with that news that the Prime Minister is going to be uh, spending up to $4.3 million on his home um, in the central coast in New South Wales. That kicked off a discussion about negative gearing with the Greens uh, releasing some analysis suggesting a lot of renters could become homeowners under Labor's old housing policies. Uh, and then today, this announcement from uh, the Coalition Opposition Leader Peter Dutton heading to Perth, heading to uh, significantly a Greenfields housing development site on the outskirts of Perth to announce this $5 billion fund um, that was really uh, based around speeding up infrastructure delay. So that's um, as uh, uh, Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, who was also there, Bridget McKenzie, said uh, the not sexy stuff when it comes to housing. So that's things like sewage, it's things like uh, access roads, um, it's things like water, it's things like power. Uh, what this new coalition policy, which we're just sort of getting the details of now, um, what it appears to be uh, stimulating really is construction of these sorts of infrastructure things which are critical to building new houses. The coalition says this will lead to um, uh, around half a million new homes. This is what Opposition Leader Peter Dutton has to say about the Coalition's new housing policy. Today I announced that a Coalition Government will invest $5 billion into creating at least 500,000 new homes for people here in Perth, people in New South Wales, in Victoria, in Tasmania, right across the country. Uh, this is a game changer for young Australians who can't see the opportunity yet to own a home. Ollie, what has been the government response to this? Well, Ruby, um, just moments ago we saw the Federal Housing Minister, Claire O'Neill, uh, get up and really respond just uh, initially to this new policy from um, the uh, Federal Opposition. Um, here is uh, Housing Minister Claire O'Neill, here's what she had to say um, in these early stages responding to this housing policy. Peter Dutton has already said he would cut $19 billion out of Labor's ambitious housing agenda. Now he wants a pat on the back for putting $5 billion back in. Peter Dutton's taking with one hand and giving with the other. It's a card trick. Housing Minister Claire O'Neill um, suggesting that uh, Opposition Leader Peter Dutton taking with one hand, picking up with the other. Look, um, Ruby, it's clear um, we're not in uh, the pre-election campaign officially yet, but um, from what we're seeing from both the major parties and the Greens, particularly this week, housing shaping up as a key election issue um, before we head to the next federal election. A woman has died and police are searching for two children missing in the water in Sydney southwest. Emergency services were called just after 10am to Floyd's Bay in Lansvale following reports a woman and two children were in the water in distress. The woman was pulled from the water soon afterwards but could not be revived. An extensive multi-agency search is underway for the two children. A glitch has seen some Commonwealth Bank customers charged twice for their purchases. Reporter Leah Harris is live for us in the studio now and joins us for more on this. Hi, Leah. Uh, how widespread is this issue? 
Well, the Commonwealth Bank has so far not told us how many customers they believe are affected, but many of them have reached out to us or taken to social media to speak about this, and they've told us that they noticed this morning their accounts were either overdrawn or much lower than they anticipated, and that some, if not all, of the transactions they made yesterday had been charged twice. So a lot of people, as I said, took to social media to speak about this, and you know, one said they were $400 overdrawn and wouldn't be able to buy nappies for their child. Another said they were buying medication at the pharmacy when their card got declined and they all say that the one of the biggest issues is that the Commonwealth Bank has not been able to tell them when this money will be returned to their accounts and the communication from the bank has apparently been quite poor. I also spoke to a man in Melbourne just a short time ago and he went to work this morning, his card was declined and he's been on the phone to the bank on hold for two hours, unable to get any answers and he's not sure how he's going to get home because his card is overdrawn and he needs to get an Uber home. So it's it's a huge issue for many people. Now, the Commonwealth Bank has released a statement saying we're, they're urgently reversing the transactions and any fees and charges will be refunded. They say it may take some time, but they can't say how much time that will be, and they have apologised to customers for the inconvenience. Let's hope they can get it fixed up quickly. A really unpleasant start to the weekend for many people. Leah Harris, thank you. Thanks. Residents in the nation's capital are casting their ballots in the ACT election. It will determine whether Labor is returned for a historic seventh term of government or if the Canberra Liberals will end 23 years in opposition. ACT political reporter Harry Frost is live for us. Harry, what's the mood been like among voters where you are? Well, Ruby, a little bit like the weather here in Canberra today, perhaps. Uh, sometimes sunny, sometimes cloudy. Maybe the appropriate metaphor or cliche is mixed. It's hard to tell the exact mood of the electorate. One, because there's not much in the way of public polling uh, here in the ACT. Secondly, is that so many people have already voted. The Electoral Commission says around 60% of people in the ACT who are eligible voters have used pre-polling in the two weeks leading up to today. So it sounds like a lot of people had already made up their minds. As for those people who were voting today on election day for a democracy sausage or a bit of cake perhaps, um, we spoke to a number of them. Here's what they had to say. Because Canberra is the only jurisdiction in Australia which has those rental cap laws, it enabled me to save for four years to finally build enough to have a deposit to become a first homeowner. So for me, the fact that the Labor government and the Greens want to continue that policy, that was an easy choice for me. It's hard to identify with any of the major parties. I think um, once a, a group has been in power that long, I think, um, I think they get a bit too comfortable and I think it might be time for a change. And Harry, talk us through some of the defining moments or themes of this election campaign. Well, Ruby, as you mentioned earlier, I guess the overarching theme here is, as it is many elections, uh, a question of continuity or change. As you say, Labor has been in power here for 23 years, much of that uh, with the ACT Greens, the Chief Minister, Andrew Barr. He's now the longest serving uh, Chief Minister in the ACT's uh, history of self-government. Uh, Labor have been leaning into that uh, a little bit. They've been talking about the need for continuity, I guess, in a more... Uh, uh, a time of, of, of change in, in, in the global situation when there's uh, questions around the, the future of the economy. They point to their record for things like infrastructure, a recent upgrade of the Canberra Hospital, the ACT's major tertiary hospital for instance, as well as uh, light rail, a project that's been discussed ad nauseum here uh, in the ACT election campaign. The opposition, the Canberra Liberals, well they're trying to end 23 years in the political wilderness. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Lee, their leader, leaning into cost of living pressures, that uh, issue that we we see a right around the country and arguing there's a different way to approach how to tackle that, uh, uh, arguing for caps on rate increases, reductions in payroll taxes for business, for instance, also saying to, that she wants to scrap uh, a plan to uh, take light rail to Woden in Canberra's south. And then, of course, as we heard from those uh, voters there as well, there's the question of independence in this election, whether the success of uh, David Pocock, who managed to become a, a senator here in the ACT, knocking out um, the Liberals' long um, hold on a Senate seat here in the ACT, whether that will be replicated uh, here at the ACT election as well. So uh, a number of themes and of course controversies in the campaign as well, that now infamous 
footage of Elizabeth Lee, the Canberra Liberals leader, um, giving the middle finger to a journalist uh, in the later days of the election campaign. There's also been controversies uh, with ghosts of social media past, posts from uh, Greens and Canberra Liberals members and, and Labor having to uh, retract what it's uh, an attack had that um, had attacked the deputy leader uh, on her position on abortion also in the, the last days of the campaign. So, uh, as with every campaign, there's been controversies, but some of those key themes, I guess, are themes that we're seeing right across the country, Ruby. Harry Frost in Canberra, thank you for that. To the Middle East now, where Hamas has confirmed the death of its leader, Yahya Sinwar, after an Israeli strike in southern Gaza. The militant group is promising to maintain its campaign against Israeli forces. World leaders are hoping a ceasefire and a hostage deal between Hamas and Israel could be back on the table with Sinwar out of the picture. But it's not certain a new Hamas leader would take a different position in negotiations. Middle East correspondent Matthew Doran has the details from Jerusalem. Hamas's deputy chief in Gaza, the first representative of the group to speak, confirming Yahya Sinwar had been killed but insisting his death won't lead to any sort of capitulation by Hamas in Gaza. We assure that this blood will lighten our path and increase our motivation for steadiness. And the Hamas movement will continue, the path of the founding leaders and martyrs, until we reach our people's ambition of full liberation. The comments coming as Israel released more vision, which it claims is of the operation which killed Sinwar, a tank firing upon the building he'd run into. The IDF only realising they'd killed the Hamas leader once they retrieved his body. Hamas will now have to pick a new leader, and the speculation is rife as to exactly who that will be. One of the first items on their agenda will be considering where Hamas stands on the idea of a ceasefire and a hostage deal with Israel. In the hours after Sinwar's death, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu implored Hamas to hand over the more than 100 hostages still held by the group. The US President Joe Biden agreeing, discussing that very issue with Mr Netanyahu in a phone call. I told the Prime Minister of Israel yesterday, let's also make this moment an opportunity to seek a path to peace, a better future in Gaza without Hamas. And I look forward to discussing Iran. But Hamas's deputy chief in Gaza insists the group's position is crystal clear. Those prisoners will not return to you until the aggression on our people in Gaza is stopped. With your full withdrawal, the release of our heroes, the prisoners from the occupation jails, and we will continue with the Hamas path. While Israel may have hoped its decision to release drone vision of Sinwar's final moments would aid in its public relations battle, giving it something of a trophy to display after months of searching for the Hamas leader, there is a chance it's actually had the opposite effect, emboldening Hamas, its supporters and Palestinians more broadly, giving them something to cling to, aiding in the narrative that Sinwar was fighting until the very end. Indeed, rallies have been held in some parts of the Arab world, such as Yemen, in the wake of his death. And all the while the attention has been on this major development, Israel's bombardment of Gaza does continue, particularly in the north. Local health authorities saying dozens have been killed in and around Jabalia today, the siege stretching into its second week and now claiming the lives of hundreds. Israel also continues to fight against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and it is planning its retaliation for that barrage of missile strikes against Israel. The missiles fired by Iran earlier this month. The US President Joe Biden saying he has an idea of when and how Israel will retaliate, but he's keeping those details close to his chest. In the US, the November presidential election is rapidly approaching. Democrat Kamala Harris and Republican Donald Trump have both set their sights on the key battleground state of Michigan. The vice president began her day in Grand Rapids before holding events in Lansing and Oakland County, northwest of Detroit. The former president has his own event in Oakland County in the afternoon before an evening rally in Detroit. Musician Usher is expected to join Kamala Harris at a rally in Atlanta.
US President Joe Biden has urged the West to sustain its support for Ukraine against Russia ahead of a bleak winter, amid questions over whether US support for Ukraine will continue after the looming election. Joe Biden was in Berlin to hold meetings with NATO superpowers, the UK, France and Germany. Bridget Rollison reports. Well, the war in Ukraine was one of the key focuses of this meeting between US President Joe Biden and the European Quad leaders in Berlin. This meeting, of course, comes just two and a half weeks before the US presidential election. And there are concerns about what will happen in Ukraine if Donald Trump wins. And that's because he signaled that he would be a bit more reluctant to continue with support for Ukraine, which means that it could be losing its biggest financial and military backer. In the meantime, though, the UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer and the US Prime Minister Joe Biden have urged the West to sustain their support for Ukraine as it faces a bleak winter. We cannot let up. We must sustain our support. In my view, we must keep going until Ukraine wins a just and durable peace. So as Ukraine enters a difficult winter, it is important to say we're with you, we're absolutely united in our resolve and we'll back Ukraine for as long as it takes. Now, in another development, South Korea is claiming that North Korea has agreed to deploy 12,000 troops to help Russia in its invasion of Ukraine. While there's been mounting evidence that Russia has been using North Korean missiles and technology, it's never actually used soldiers. Moscow has dismissed these reports as fake news, but it comes just a day after the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said that country had intelligence that North Korean soldiers were on their way to Russia, and he said this would be the first step to a world war. King Charles and Queen Camilla are enjoying a rest day in Sydney ahead of events in Sydney and Canberra. The pair arrived last night in Sydney and were greeted on the tarmac by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and his partner Jody Hayden. Their trip won't be as action-packed as previous visits due to the King's cancer treatment, which has been temporarily paused. The royal visit has also given a young royalist an opportunity to meet the monarchs. Kai was diagnosed with a serious blood disorder at nine years old and had been wishing for a royal experience of his own. Make-A-Wish Australia stepped in and last night Kai was given the opportunity to present Queen Camilla with some flowers at the couple's official welcome. Kai explains how it made him feel. I was slightly nervous but yeah. I was uh, also excited. So from a young age I have because um, my dad would go on holidays to England and buy back like royal family toys which right. I play with. So. Yeah so I got diagnosed with severe aplastic anemia which is a blood disorder that affects the bone marrow mm. so I had to get a transplant uh, that my sister donated. Okay. So right. 1.6 litres. Logging is a major source of income for many Pacific countries, with timber being the Solomon Islands' biggest export. But as more foreign-owned companies compete for the natural resource, it's creating divisions in local communities and exacting a heavy toll on the environment. Reporter Christina amanu Leong travelled to Makira province to witness the impact. In Solomon Islands, logging is our economic lifeblood, but its impact is complicated. They promised they would help the school, help the church, housing, but you can see nothing's happened. Landowners say logging companies often don't follow through on promises made in exchange for a logging licence. And there are environmental impacts too. After logging began, there's been a decline in fishing because there's fewer fish. We have travelled all the way here to the nearest log pond to see firsthand what it's like. <laughs> we met Jenny, one of the many local women who end up in relationships and having children with foreign logging workers. When my baby was six months old, Johnny left on holiday. He just returned last year. But for many, their partners don't come back. A UN report last year also found some women are even sold to foreign workers for a bride price. Girls as young as 13 are left behind with the children. There's a saying we joke about, which is, log marriages are only for coffee and noodles, which literally means the girls are so young they still can't cook a meal. The company which employs Angeline has denied any wrongdoing and the Forestry Ministry says a new bill is being drafted to protect the interests of Indigenous people. 
but didn't note any initiatives to protect women in the industry. Some villagers have decided, well, logging isn't worth it. Ever since logging came to this region, resisting has been our main challenge. They've set aside a small portion of land for commercial use, but that's all they'll allow. Though conservation takes patience, we'll wait. One day we'll reap the benefits. I haven't seen any tribe better off than we are. Whichever side you are on, let's hope logging does not destroy this patch of paradise. Chris and Rita Aumanu Leong, ABC News, Makira. It's been almost a year since the Victorian government launched its container deposit scheme, aiming to divert 80% of material from landfill by 2030. Whether it's been successful is up for debate, with critics saying more containers need to be eligible and the 10 cent refund should be increased. But it's starting to pay dividends for those who do collect containers. Camperdown man Brian Stewart has been collecting cans for more than half his life. He estimates he's put through more than 100,000 containers through the Container Deposit Scheme since it began in Victoria a year ago. 12 months I've been feeding through the machine here and I've put $10,000 through so far. He's even managed to buy a second-hand caravan with the money. Can money. I used me can money. And he's not the only one making the most of the scheme. Victorians have returned more than 900 million containers to date, pocketing over $90 million in refunds. But there's calls to increase the refund amount from 10 cents. In parts of Europe, the return rate is about 40 cents. Now that may be a bit ambitious, but you know, if we can do something a little bit better than 10 cents in the future, that would be a great start. There's also calls to widen the types of containers eligible to include wine and milk bottles. We had the opportunity to really lead the nation as such, but you know, wine bottles and, and there's a number of other ones that people are saying, why weren't they included? And now the other states are going to be including them. Vic Return says there are no plans to expand the list of eligible containers and that the 10 cent refund will remain fixed with an increase in the deposit amount not currently being considered. After collecting hundreds of thousands of cans over more than 30 years, Brian is looking forward to taking a well-deserved break. He's going to pack the fishing rod and take his new caravan on its maiden voyage to Yambuck for a fishing trip. And upon his return, he'll get back to work. No, nope. I'll keep collecting. Hard work pays off. Jean Bell, ABC News, Camperdown. Let's get some sport headlines now with Daniela Intilli. Tim Zhu and Bakra Mutuzaliyev have weighed in and faced off ahead of their super welterweight title fight tomorrow morning in Orlando, with both Zhu and the undefeated Russian champion weighing in comfortably under the limit. The Australian boxer is finding for the first time since a controversial split decision loss against Sebastian Fundura in Las Vegas in March. It was Zhu's first career defeat and denied the 29-year-old a chance to be a unified WBO and WBC champion with Fandora stealing both crowns. Tomorrow's fight also represents Mutazeliev's first defence of the vacant title he won in April. The Kangaroos have begun their Rugby League Pacific Championships campaign with an 18-0 win over Tonga at Lang Park. We've got a few deputants there and particularly in the spine, so really happy with the performance and um, yeah, really, really encouraging as far as, you know, improving. Earlier, the Gillaroos hammered Papua New Guinea 84-0 in their Pacific Championships opener in Brisbane in a record result for the Australian women's team. Winger Julia Robinson created history with a six-try haul, breaking the record for the most tries in a test match by a Gillaroo. Fellow winger Jakara Whitefield scored five tries, while Tamika Upton and Isabel Kelly each scored doubles in the 17-try route. The Gillaroos can secure a place in the Cup final with a win over the Kiwi Ferns next week in Christchurch. 
Port Adelaide has moved closer to a first finals AFLW appearance after defeating St Kilda by 15 points at Alberton Oval to win 7-5-47 to 5-2-32. The power booted five goals to one in the first quarter, including two majors from Abby Dalrick to race to a 25-point lead at the first change. 18-year-old Shanae Goody finished with 22 touches while Dalrick had 19 disposals. Port sit in eighth spot with a fourth straight win while the Saints slipped to ninth. The power did suffer a injury concern in the final term with Matilda Schulz injuring her leg. Oh, look, they brought it to us. Um, I was glad that the girls, we stuck to our footy and got the job done. But yeah, no credit to the girls. It was, um, yeah, it was a big effort. Red Bull's Max Verstappen has taken pole position for Formula One's sprint race at the United States at Grand Prix in Austin, <laughs> Texas. The championship leader just beat out Mercedes' George Russell with Ferrari's Charles Leclerc in third. Championship challenger leader Lando Norris was fourth fastest for McLaren. Norris's teammate Australia's Oscar Piastri had his final lap time deleted and is set to line up 16th ahead of tomorrow morning's race. The Sydney Kings have posted back-to-back -back wins to move to second on the NBL ladder, beating reigning champions the Tasmania Jack Jumpers 81 to 71 in Launceston. The Kings had 13 turnovers in the first half and were 16 points down, but bounced back after the break. Two-time championship captain Xavier Cooks led the charge for the Kings with 15 points and 12 rebounds in his 100th game for Sydney. Jordan Crawford top scored for the Jack Jumpers with 25 points, including 18 in the first half. Sydney are now on five wins and two losses while Tasmania slipped to ninth spot with four defeats from six games. A grand final rematch between the Central Coast Mariners and Melbourne Victory kicked off the start of the A-League men's season last night with both sides playing out a dramatic nil-all draw amid torrential rain in Gosford. Victory almost got ahead late in the first half after they were awarded a penalty but Bruno Fornaroli hit the post and couldn't convert. Melbourne was down to 10 players after captain Roderick Miranda was shown a red card in the 59th minute for a high boot and his side showed desperate defence to hang on to a draw. New Zealand will face off with South Africa in the Cricket T20 World Cup final after edging out the West Indies by eight runs in Shajar. Georgia Plummer's 33 from 31 balls helped the White Ferns reach nine for 128. The West Indies slipped to five for 63 in reply after three wickets from Eden Carson and two from Nelly Kerr. Let's take a quick look at tomorrow's weather in the capitals. Brisbane and Sydney both partly cloudy. A sunny day in Canberra. A possible morning shower in Melbourne. In Hobart, a partly cloudy day. Sunny in Adelaide. Showers developing in Perth. And in Darwin, a shower or two with a top of 34. And there's more on the ABC News app and, of course, on ABC iView too. I'm Ruby Cornish. Stay with us. America, are you OK? is up next. What's happening to these men in their 50s is a result of all the concussions they had in their 20s.